So we're dealing with heroes or villains. Which one are you? Are you a hero for God and everything is always good? Are you one of those Josephs that not a single bad word is said every time there's sin? You flee from it. You do what you can to glorify God and show Him in all the all of your life. Are you one of those villains like we talked about Belshazzar a few weeks ago who is always out for himself, thinking about his needs and his wants and his desires and not what God would have? Or you're probably like most of us, you're in the middle. I mean, I would say David had his heroic times and he had his villainous times, times that he loved the Lord and times that he thought about himself. And so most of us are going to kind of lie in between there somewhere. And I hope if you're a hero, you'll rise out of that. Again, I want you to be perfect. I want you to strive for perfection. I want you to look for Christ. And I want you to do all you can not to sin. You're going to. But I want you to do what you can not to. But understand the hero is the one who's going to see when he sinned and he's going to be rising up. Please, Lord, forgive me. I can't believe I did this again. Lord, please forgive me for doing it. I shouldn't have done this. I've, I've dishonored you. I've, I've, I've made the Holy Spirit go part with part of the things that I've done. and He's been dragged along with me. Lord, please forgive me for dragging you through this sin with me. So a hero will get there and he'll get back on track. A hero will understand that God's forgiven. If you are as a person out here right now and you're looking at things in your background saying, God can't forgive me for this, or you're saying, and I've done things right now that I don't even know why God would ever want me, you need to get that out of your head because that's sin itself. God will forgive you. God will allow you to move beyond it. Now, are you going to have trouble forgetting it? Yeah, you've been through it. And there will be consequences for the things you do in life. But we serve a great and mighty God who can forgive you and make you pure and whole again. Don't look back no matter what that thing is. And I know many of you have got stories. I don't necessarily know your stories. I know we all have stories. Things that, oh, how did I ever do this thing? This is the worst thing in the world that God can never forgive me for. No. That's why he sent his son so that you can be forgiven for those things. So move on. I want you to exit these doors today whole and clean. I don't want you to come in with baggage and leave with baggage. We've kind of wasted our time if you've done that. Understand that, Lord, please forgive me. I've done this thing. Whatever that thing is, it's going to be different for all of us. Lord, I've done it. Please forgive it. Take it from me. Let me breathe again. Get that that weight off my shoulders so that I can stand tall. Yeah, this may be the, the thing that you're able to use. This experience that you've been through, God may be able to bless other people through it. You don't know what's going to happen from your past, but God can make you whole and he can make you clean. So I want you to leave that way. Just relax a little bit. Turn it over to the Lord. He's a lot bigger than we are and he can take care of it. So we're dealing with heroes and villains in our overall passages in Romans 15, 1 and 2. Great, great set of verses and I want you to say these out with me. You ready? Now, we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us must please his neighbor for his good to build him up. And we talked again just for like 10 seconds last week. We reminded us that we are strong because of Christ. If this morning you have not accepted Christ in your life, it's time to make that happen. Just stop holding off. Say, Lord, whatever you want from me, I'm willing to do that thing. And it's going to get really good real quick. But that's how we're strong. We're strong because the Lord is in our hearts. If you haven't accepted the Lord, I want you to come talk to me at any point. We'll work this thing out. I'll tell you everything I know, and we'll pray that the Lord will reveal himself to you. But this is the kind of people you need to be. You are strong because the Lord's in your heart. Because he is here, you can do anything. You can conquer those mountains, those huge foes that are ahead of you. You can tackle them. That's the kind of people you need to be. Well, if any of you ever had to confront someone, And let's say it's not necessarily your kids. We have to do that every day. That's a daily process of confronting our kids. But somebody in your life, someone, or maybe if you're a boss, you probably do this a lot. Again, some bosses are much better at this than others. I'm always always wanting to bring people back. I don't want to beat them down. But sometimes we have to confront people, especially if the the bottom line's not getting dealt with. And we've got to make sure that this employee is at the position and, and at the work level they need to be doing. As I was talking to one of our people this morning, all of us get in our happy level. If we're in sales, we're going to get to this certain point, And we're not going to work beyond that because this is our comfort level. I'm making enough to deal with it. Well, your, your company may need to do more. So a, a boss may have to confront you or deal with those, those things. Some of us are very good at it. Some of us don't. I wrestle with it. I don't like to get in people's faces. I don't. Now, once in a while, God will give me that righteous anger, and I will stand up to someone who I know is going through issues in their life they need to be reminded of or not what God would have for them. 
As a pastor, sometimes I've got to do that, and it's the last thing I ever want to do. I play, I play, please, Lord, just remove this thing. Let them understand it so I don't have to mess with it. Because I love this person. I don't want to have to get in and tell them they're making a mistake. Once in a while, we have to. Our elders will have to do that. Our deacons. You as a Christian friend will have to do that. I would hope you would. I would hope that at some point, if you're seeing I'm off track, you get some of you are going to come to me and say, what's going on, James? Where are you? I need you to be that way, but I'm going to do that with you. You're going to do that with each other. This is why we come together, to be better, to be stronger. So once in a while, we have to confront people. Again, a hero has to make decisions once in a while, even if they don't seem logical. I don't know if you remember that, that great plane uh, that went down in the river a while back, but Chelsea Sullenberger, his Airbus 320 took a, a bird strike, if you remember this. If you're a, a pilot, bird strikes, you would think a little bitty bird wouldn't do much, but a bird can do a lot of damage to a jet engine. Is that right, Jeff? You, you want to make sure that thing gets off the ground and down safely, so you stay away from birds. And so at this point, uh, he took this, he was heading out of LaGuardia, and took a bird strike. And if anybody knows anything about planes, you cannot turn around and land again. You lose all your lift in a turn. So you usually take that thing straight out or a few degrees like this. This is all you've got, about this far out. And so at this point, he decides all I've got in front of me is a big river, the Hudson River. Can you imagine taking a beautiful plane like that into the river? But he was in New York. There's no place to land something that large. You need miles of open space. So what he did is he turned lemons into lemonade. He gave them a river cruise that day. I mean, they were supposed to go wherever they were going, and they got this beautiful river cruise with drinks and everything else. Okay? It's amazing how that plane can float like it did. He took it down in a way that you would never imagine, but he had to kind of break some rules to do it. It's not logical. Anybody's saying, please, let me give me some hard tarmac somewhere to put that thing down on. It was beautiful. Everyone was saved that day. Sometimes you have to make decisions, even if it's going to hurt a lot of people. You have to do that once in a while. Again, in war, there's always collateral damage. Sadly enough, as Americans, we're trying to fight wars without hurting anybody, and I don't know how that works. You've got to, there's no way to have a war without somebody getting hurt. The whole concept of war is that. But you look back to World War II, Harry Truman had to make a, President Truman had to make a very large decision. Do I continue this war? Do I end it quickly? And we remember he had to drop the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now understand as America, we did all we could to get those people out. They dropped leaflets and pamphlets all over saying it's coming. Get out of this area. We're trying to make an example. We're going to remind you of our strength. Get out of this area. They tended to stay there. We had many people who had lost their lives because of it. You have to weigh those decisions. Was it better to continue the war where millions of people die or to end it on one quick day and let them understand that we can do a lot more if we choose? A, a, a hero and a, a leader has to make decisions like that. A Christian person must confront people or evil when they see it, even if they know the outcome is going to be bad. Again, it's, it's always the first thing. People tend to buck up when anybody gets in their face. They just do. I understand that about people. I understand that about myself. But we understand that we also, as Christian people, have responsibility to confront evil when we see it, to confront sin. We're supposed to. I want you to be better. I don't want you to continue in the life that you're living. There's better things for you. Now, again, if we, as we talked a little bit in Romans last week in, in, in Bible study, sometimes what's bad for you may not be bad for me. But there are sins in life that are non-negotiable, and we always have to make sure we confront those. Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins against you, go and rebuke him in private. If any of you have trouble with one another, the first thing I want to do is say, what happened when you went to talk to this person? I expect you to follow Matthew 18, 15. I'm not getting involved until you've dealt with it. It's very clear. God wants us to deal with people a certain way. So if you've been wronged, if you've had someone get in your face or someone who's done something incorrect with reference to speaking with you or dealing with you, you need to deal with that person and, and speak with them first before you bring anyone else in. And 99% of the time, it all works out beautifully that way because God's word is always good. But we need to confront people. Today we're going to discuss people who are confronted. We'll see what happens with it. We're in the book of Acts. So if you've got your Bible open up there in the New Testament, great, great book written by Luke. Not much... Not much uh, Discussion on that. Everyone believes Luke wrote it. Somewhere in AD 62. And we know that the temple's still in existence because the book doesn't talk about the temple being down, so it's not after AD 70. And there's really no persecution per se. Persecution became big in the mid 60s AD. So we're talking probably early 60s, around AD 62. Acts is the connection between the Gospels and the Epistles. If you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see what Jesus did. Then Jesus leaves. You look at all the, the, the epistles, the writings of John, the writings of Paul, they're talking about an existing church. 
The book of Acts bridges that. It's such a beautiful book. And it's such so many great, great stories in there. It was written to trace the development of the body of Christ over one generation from a Jewish membership to one of a Gentile membership. God is no longer keeping it among his own people. He's sending it to the world. Whoever listens, and sadly enough, every one of these guys in, in Acts, you, know, you look at Peter and Paul, they always went to the temple first, hoping that God's people would get it. And after they re- ignored him, after they left him, he would go to the rest of the world. So we're in the book of Acts, chapter 5. And I want to just read the first two verses. So please stand with me as we honor God's word. Here's what it says. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. However, he kept back part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge and brought a portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. You wouldn't think it'd get tough from there on out, but we'll see what happens. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you're almighty, and I thank you for these people, Lord, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for Luke telling us what happened to the early church, Lord, and let us understand that you want us to always be true and righteous and honorable in front of you. We say all this in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Excuse me. A little bit of backstory. I don't like just pulling things out of context. The book of Acts is an exciting book. It really does detail what happens when Christ leaves. Okay, so we, we're finding out what happened to the church. And I would encourage you, if you're not watching that, the show on NBC, AD, uh, the story continues. You need to DVR it or something. It's great. It really is exciting. And I want to support it when they tell the story, the biblical story, really well. Now, understand they're taking the things out of the Bible and connecting it. So there'll be some things you've never seen that aren't in the Bible because they're trying to tell a story. They're connecting the story. But when it's on the Bible, it's just it's right on. It's a great thing. Me and Marky, my little eight-year-old, we love to watch it. He just looks forward to it every week. What's, what's Saul? What's that bad guy going to do this week? And so he loves to hear the story. But we hear in this, this is what it's all about. It's talking about the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit comes. Again, God has left us. God is no longer in a tabernacle. He's no longer in a building. He's not behind a big curtain. Christ came. Christ was here for 33 years, and now he's left. But God always is among his people. So the Holy Spirit comes. We have the Holy Spirit in us today. 3,000 people join the church in a day. Why does that not happen today? No, it does in crazy parts of the world. Not in America. We're too savvy. We're too smart. We can solve our own problems. Again, Christianity in another generation or two is going to be really fighting an uphill battle. If it's not already. They're trying to do everything they can to remove us from every part of life. It'll be interesting to see what happens. We need to pray and we need to be strong. You need to stand tall. People are so excited at this point in history that they begin preparing for Christ's return. They think Jesus has left and they think he's going to come back in their lifetime. So they do all they can. At this point, they start uh, selling off their things and they live like com- kind of like a commune. They spend time together. It wouldn't be a bad idea. They, they spend time in the morning. They go to the temple. They're still dealing with the Old Testament and the worship there. So they go to the temple in the morning, and they come back in the afternoon and start talking about Jesus. They come together. They may have the Lord's Supper at night. They eat together. What a great thing this is. It could be all kinds of fun if everyone worked and gave equally. You know, I think I'd have a good time spending more time with you guys like that. That wouldn't be a bad thing. I need my space once in a while. I've got to have a lot of space around me, okay? And so I'd have to have my own room, at least in the big house. But it wouldn't be a bad thing to spend time with you like that. But as we're going to see, not everyone works equally. That's what we happened with the Puritans when they came over. They were supposed to be one big happy commune. People weren't working. People were dying. They weren't making enough. Some people were working harder than others. At this point, the pilgrims and all those, they had to do all they could to start separating land. If you don't work, you don't eat. Simple enough. But we're going to see what happens today when we don't work equally, when we don't give equally. brings us to where we are. The first thing I want you to know this morning, we're just kind of getting some concepts of life. Okay? The first thing I want you to know is there are two kinds of people in the church. And I'm not just talking about those who know the Lord and those who don't. We'll see if we can get into this a little bit. There are two kinds of people in the church. In, uh, if, if you don't know, I like Star Trek, and I'm, I'm not big in original series. The one in 64 to 66, that was before my time, even though it's kind of, kind, of, kind of fun. But there was an episode called Mirror, Mirror. I don't know if any of you know Star Trek or any at all, but Mirror, Mirror is one of the big ones. In this, we see the evil counterparts of the par- in the parallel uni- universe. Somehow, the evil parallel universe bridges over into our universe. So we've got an evil Kirk on the good Enterprise. We've got an evil McCoy on a good Enterprise. All these things, they somehow switch out. 
Okay, the good characters are sent into the evil world at this point. It's kind of fun, and it makes for a good little story. Instead of the United Federation of Planets, we have the Terran Empire. And everything that's good about the United Federation of Planets is evil about the Terran Empire. They just dominate, and they tear everybody up, and that kind of a thing. Kirk is power-hungry and dictatorial, whereas we all know Kirk isn't like that. McCoy is malevolent and cruel. Only Spock's able to see the difference. He's the only one who can determine truly what's going on and that this is not the, the Kirk that I know. This is not the McCoy. Something has happened. How do we solve that? The same kind of things in the church. There are two kinds of people in the church. There are those who use their gifts and talents and those who don't. There are those who truly love the Lord and want to give everything they can. And then there are those who are always holding things back just in case this thing falls apart. Which one are you? Again, we saw the two universes there in the Star Trek episode, and it makes for an easy writing. But sadly enough, it's a little more dark and serious when it comes to real world. There's those who look correct and beautiful, but they're corrupt at the core. I hope you're not that, that group. I hope you look beautiful and, and trustworthy and honorable because you are that thing. Only your life will show the difference. Verses 1 and 2 again. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. However, he kept back some of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge. She wasn't ignorant about this. And brought a portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Boom, I'm so glad. Look at this. These are wealthy people. They're given a good amount of money. Ananias and Sapphira, they're wealthy. They, they have the ability to sell land because they have a lot of it. Again, I'm sure they had a nice tent there while they were living. I'm sure that when they came, they gave a whole bunch and everybody could see it. It sounds like the old temple system where the, the, the coins would drop in from the, this poor little lady dropping a coin in. And these other guys would be pouring bags in so that the noise is loud and everybody can hear it. This is what we see here, here happening. But just a few verses earlier, if you read right just two verses earlier, a guy named Joseph and another guy named Barnabas did the same thing. Look at this in 36 and 37. Joseph, a Levite and a Cypriot by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement. Again, he's got this multiple name. Sold a field he owned. He bought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. It's the same thing. Simple enough. He had a field. He gave it to the, the apostles. Here it is. This is all for the Lord. So we see this is not a new occurrence. It happens. It's, not, it's a, pretty much a common experience when all our people are trying to live together. You would give it to the apostles because they were God's emissaries. It's not like the apostles are getting it. They're like the leaders, like Moses over the children of Israel. They're the ones making sure everyone's taken care of. If we're all going to live together, someone's got to make sure everyone eats. We've got to make sure we've got a roof over our heads and all the basic necessities for a small community. So that takes money to do that. And so people were selling things to make sure that they were taken care of. Yet here, this couple decides to keep a portion of that sale. Is there a problem, the question is, is there a problem with selling land and keeping some of the profit? No. In the real world, no. I mean, many of you do such sacrificial things for this church and for ministry around. What a blessing it is that you have the resources to do that. God's not necessarily calling for all of it. He just wants you to do your part. And he may call you at some point to give everything. But for the most part, he's just pleased that you're doing what he's called you to do, if it's that 10% or 20% or to give half of it. I've known people that, you know what, this is really the Lord's, I'll give it all. He gave it to me, I'm going to give it back. What a blessing that is. So there's nothing wrong with the concept of selling a piece of land or selling a vehicle or selling something that you own and giving the money to the church or to not give it all to the church. You guys do transactions all the time. It doesn't necessarily come here. It doesn't make it bad. It's a blessing when you give. God knows we need money to live. The problem here is that they're full intent and that everyone thought they were giving everything. By coming into this community of Christian believers, they were to give everything up and to sacrifice for the Lord. Yet they didn't. So when they came and had this large offering, I'm sure it was a big one, probably got as, broke it down into as many denominations as they could to carry it in on a tractor or something like that or a, a wheelbarrow. They were supposed to give it all. Colossians 3.17, Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I can guarantee that if they would have given all of it, God would have blessed them abundantly because of their sacrifice. The same thing with any of you. When you sacrifice for God's work, God will take care of you. He's not going to leave his people out to beg for food. He's not. 
If you are following Him, if you are sacrificing for Him, He will take care of you and believe that I'm a perfect example. When I've done things that He's asked me to do, He has abundantly blessed me beyond anything I could dream of. Every time. Now, is it the way I expect it to come back to me? No. If I give 50 bucks, I expect that 50 bucks to come back. No, it's not that way. It's not that way. It may mean that your relationship with your wife or your spouse becomes better. It may mean that your children's relationship and yours is restored. It may mean that you get this windfall check from something you thought you paid and it all of a sudden came back and where does money come from? It may not be 50 bucks, he gives you 500 bucks. But God never is predictable, so don't expect dollar for dollar. God just may make you healthier. He may tell you how to change your diet. Because now I don't have any money, I have to eat more meager, eat beans and rice. That may be the healthiest thing you could do. You all live another five years because of that. Who knows? But everyone was to live communally, therefore the money was needed for the group. These people come, kept some back from themselves. And if they kept some back from themselves, that means they're not totally sold out for this group. If this thing falls apart, I still have some money. If this doesn't work out, we still got some cash, we can start over again. That's the concept. That's the problem here. Again, they were not relying on God. The whole issue of them living communally is that they were supposed to rely on God. God will take care of their needs. Just like He did the children of Israel in the desert for 40 years. They made it out of there. Now, did they eat filet mignon every night? No. They may have had a pretty strict diet. But they ate it. They were healthy and strong and able to take the land after that 40 years. But God took care of them. He did amazing things before them. He showed Himself to them every day. Is that not a more beautiful thing to see God than to have a few bucks in my pocket? Yet these people didn't. Again, I learned this process in seminary. There was not a single month, and I'm an engineer, that I could balance the books on our checkbook. It couldn't happen. I couldn't. I went from making close to $100,000 a year to twelve. The next year I went to seminary. It doesn't happen. That was a long time ago, so that was even better money. $12,000 with a, a, a family, babies coming on the way, trying to pay for seminary, trying to get through it. I came out with a perfect credit score and no debt. And yet no month could I add it up and it makes sense. But I was doing what God called me to do. Sadly enough, I started making money again. I forget how that works. Isn't that funny how that is? He shows himself to me for years and years. I get a few more bucks in my pocket, get in ministry, things are good. Start relying on my own strength. Continue to learn. It's this process all the time. Here I am. I'll, I'll learn it, and then I'll get happy again, and I'll have to go through it and fight it again. So the problem isn't keeping the money, but going through a line saying you're giving it all and yet keeping some. God doesn't like liars. He doesn't. Proverbs 12, 22, Lying lips are detestable to the Lord, but faithful people are His delight. I want you to be faithful people. Not for my sake. God's going to take care of this church whether you give a dime or not. Whether you give your talents to help us out or not. Whether you're out any time we do any evangelistic work, God is going to take care of His people. And the people that need to hear the message will be the ones that get taken care of every time. His work will get accomplished whether you're obedient or not. It's just so much more fun to be on the good side of it. You know? It's so much more fun to say, I was part of God's work. That person that came to the Lord, I was there that day. Let me tell you this story. That's such excitement. That's fun. Rather than to sit on the sideline griping and complaining about why we're doing all we're doing. There's so many churches out there fighting over every little penny when our work should be telling the story of God and loving Him through it. So are you one of those people that give everything? Are you one of those people that give nothing? And again, giving is a relative term. Time, effort, resources, funds, whatever money, work you want to put on that, you define it how you choose. Now, God's going to see it in a lot more ways maybe than you see it. But however you look at it, are you one of those people giving everything? Anytime I call you, you're the ready to go, and there are so many people like that. Trent's a perfect example. I, I know he hates me bringing him up. He has such a sacrificial heart. The man will do anything, give you the shirt off his back. Therefore, I can brag about him. He didn't want me to. But I love that spirit. We need more of that. What could we do if we were all that sacrificial? Or are you the other side, the person who never gives anything? No matter what, you won't even come to a class. Oh, I'll come to church because this is what I do on a Sunday morning and I will give that time. Other than that, it's my time. Got to go fishing or go whatever we do out here in New Mexico. 
You know, not too many lakes. Go fishing. Go climb a mountain. It's my thing. Are you that person? Or are you one in the middle? You're trying to look good, but not really giving everything God's asked you to give. It is difficult when He asks you those big ones. It is. It's tough. But those are where the glory comes. When He asks you for something above and beyond, something sacrificial, that's where He's really ready to say, I'm about to do something mighty in your life. Are you really, to, really ready to follow me for it? You do this thing, it's going to get good. If you don't, fine. It's your choice. But I'm asking you to do this thing. Where are you going to be? Who are you this morning? So there are two kinds of people in the church. The second thing we need to understand that people cannot hide from God. You cannot hide from God. Now, you may be able to hide from me because most of the part I'm probably not looking at you and I won't be thinking about you. But you can't hide from God because His only focus is you and your life. He has so many good things for you. Again, we may be able not to be able to see between a repentant heart and one who's lying, but God always can. I don't know if you know the Lord truly or not except for the fruit in your life. And understand I'm looking at you. I am watching you. I'm a watcher. I'm not a talker. I'm a looker. I'm wanting to see, is your life represent what I think a Christian person should? You know, are you using your talents and your gifts? Do you, do you have all this fruit that's coming off this tree, that God's making this fruit? Are you giving it away to other people? Or do you keep it for yourself? That's how I know. That's all I can do is best to determine. Many people I will say, you know, that person loves the Lord. I see it. Let me tell you 48 different ways. And then there are those that I don't know. They say they do. But I can say a lot of things in this world and it not mean a single thing. The only way you can prove to me if you love the Lord is the life that you live. I don't want to hear your words. I love you. You can talk to me all you want. But I really don't want to hear your words about how much you love God. If you love God, what are you doing for Him? Is that faith going into action? Again, Peter gets on them immediately when he finds out what's going on. Let's go to verses 3 and 4. Peter's not an not a easy one. He gets pretty straightforward with them. Then Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds from that field? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Again, you know that Peter was immediately told, God said, Peter, deal with this thing. Who knows? I don't know if you're giving or not. I don't know what anybody gives. I don't want to know. I know what I'm doing. I'm, doing I'm, I'm pleased with what God's allowing me to do. I'm content there. I always want to give more. I would love for God to give me more so I can give more to His church. I just find out I cannot give Him. But I don't know what you're doing and it's none of my business. But Peter immediately was told by the Lord, something's going on here. This is not right. This land was his to do with as he pleased. It was his land. He was never asked to necessarily give it to the church. No one put that on him. It wasn't his deal. Yet he lied about his intentions. It would have been better if he just kept the money than to lie about it. You know, he's trying to look good in front of everyone. You need to understand that God knows everything you do. Look at Matthew 10. So don't be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. If you're doing something now, whatever it is, if you're holding back money or you're in a secret sin, whatever it is, you're only smart for so long. You can only cover your tracks for so long. The Lord will reveal this and it will be a very painful time. So please get it right. Just get it behind you. Do what the Lord's asked you to do. Stop the sin, whatever this thing is. You know what that is. The Lord's put it on your heart right now. He is telling you right now what your thing is. Because immediately you went right to it. I know you did. So deal with that thing and move on. Ask forgiveness. Lord, please forgive me. Because you don't want him to out you. You don't want him to reveal it because it will come. And I've seen it in churches. And it's never a beautiful time. It's never a beautiful time. Again, are you a Barnabas or are you an Ananias? Do you have secret sins? God does not permit secrets. I can't tell, but God can. He will reveal you to the world. Get on track. A hero has nothing to hide. Again, I've had to deal with pastors, even in this own area. Please understand, if I hear sin in another church, I'm going to deal with the pastor on it. I've had to deal with pastors in this area over things that I thought were way wrong. That is not how a church should do it. There are no secrets among these people. Why are you doing this thing in secret? God will reveal it. Get it right. Resolve this. This is not the way you work with your people. This is not the way you work with your staff. I don't like being that way but I'm just not going to put up with it. I've seen it too long. 
Life's too short. Let's just get on track and do what God's called us to do. But just as long as there's no secrets in, in around us, there are no secrets in this church. I want you to know that I have nothing to hide. Nothing. Now, there are things that the elders and I might be working on that we don't necessarily want everybody to know yet because we haven't worked it out. Just as soon as you find out, you, you hear this rumor that we might be doing this thing. I'm so excited. I love it. We find out we're never going to do it. So now we got you excited over something that never happens. Or you may hate it. You start rallying against it, get your 48 people to sign petitions, and it was never going to happen in the first place. And so there are things that I may not necessarily bring up to you immediately because it may never happen. But I have nothing to hide. If you hear these things, come out of my office. Even though we're trying to work through it quietly and get it all worked out, I'll, I'll tell you everything I know. There are no secrets in this church. Brandon and I have talked about it. There are no, nothing that we cannot tell you about. Nothing. And if there is, then we're in sin. Please understand that. This church that I had to deal with, this pastor, I considered him to be in sin. By the way, he hid this action that he dealt with. That will not be happening here. If we deal with something, it's going to be out in the open because there's nothing to hide. If God forces us to do it, we do it. Now, I may, not, I may be dealing with something personal about you, and I will never bring that up to anyone else. It's, if you're talking to me, you're talking to me and no one else. But as a church, you don't know how much we, we're spending on this. Go ask Lisa. She's got the, the count balance in her office. At any point, you can look at every penny we spend every month, every week. Nothing to hide. Policies and procedures, everything we're doing is out in the open. I got nothing to hide. Everything I do with reference to staff or the elders, I may not want it necessarily public knowledge, but I'll tell you about it if you come and ask. Okay, you're here. Let's talk about it. Maybe you can tell me something I don't need. I need to know about it. There are no secrets. Jehovah's Witnesses in the Masonic Lodge. I don't like those buildings because there are no windows. It just, they may be doing great things in there. You know, it may be beautiful eating ice cream in there, but I can't tell what's going on there, so it makes me wonder what they're doing in that building with no windows. Have you got something to hide? I told you the biggest fight I've ever gotten into a church was opening these huge 30-foot windows. I wanted people driving by to be able to see what we're doing in here. we got nothing to hide. These, these ladies, they just... Oh, I was burned in effigy for about three years over that until they knew it was going to stay open, and we're not going anywhere until those windows are stayed open. I loved them through it. I think they tolerated me. These are two kind, there are two kinds of people in the church. People cannot hide from God. The third thing is an offense can be greater for some. I want you to know that an offense can be greater for some. There's a qu great quote from Voltaire that's used a lot in Spider-Man. It says, with great power comes great responsibility. All of you have heard it from Spider-Man. Now you can actually say that Voltaire wrote it. So you can sound intelligent when you're watching Spider-Man. Okay? But this is what we need to know. The same kind of verses in Luke, Luke 12. Much will be required of everyone who has been given much. You need to know that. If God has done more things for you and special things and things above and beyond for you, you're now responsible for it. There's no way you can hide you can't say, I didn't know what God can do. Verse 5 here. It says, when he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead, and a great fear came all on all who heard. Again, Peter quickly said, this is what you've done to the Lord. He heard the words, boom, he dropped dead right there in front of him. Sadly enough, I know Peter didn't want that. But that was God's choice and not Peter's. God says, I will remove this thing from me. As we continue the story, his body's taken out, buried. Three hours later, who comes back? His wife. Peter asks the same question to her. How much did you sell that land for? Now, what did she have the opportunity to do? She could have fessed up. She could have told the truth. Now, again, it was her husband who did it, but she knew exactly what he did. She could have made it right at this point. You know, Peter, I'm sorry, we... We only gave 60 bucks to the church. We really sold it for 100 I've got the money over here. Let me let you have that. She would have lived. What a sad story. She agrees with the price her husband's lied about. Go into verse 9 and 10. Then Peter said to her, Why did you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Instantly she dropped dead at his feet. When the young men came in, they found her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. But at that point, they would have tents or they would have had just kind of small little buildings and it would have been covered with a cloth door, just a hanging cloth door. It was probably that far off the ground. 
She was able to see feet out there walking around just waiting as Peter was in there waiting for her to come back. What a scary story that is. Again, she agrees with the price. She didn't have to. The question here is why a death sentence for a lie? How many of you have lied in here? Don't, don't raise your hand. I, I think all of you are totally honest, extremely honest. You'll never lie to me, and I love that about you. Okay? But people lie all the time. Let's just be honest and straightforward. People lie all the time. Why did Ananias and Sapphira have to die? Why did that become an initial death sentence for these people? There were probably other people within that camp that were lying that day. You know? How you feeling? Oh, I feel great. Arms, arms falling off. I'm feeling great. Okay, no problems here. Lying. Just tell me the truth. If, I, if you're doing, having trouble, tell me if you're having trouble. I love that you're encouraged, but let me be able to pray for you. You know, don't come in with a list. Let's talk about this today, James. I've got 40 people in a row. Here's the 10 things that are wrong with me today. But let me know where you are. You know, don't lie and just think things are great. If you're going through terrible sadness, it might be that one of us is supposed to encourage you by being honest and truthful in the church. Oh, my goodness, what a crazy idea that is to be honest in the church and tell the truth, telling people really what I feel and how difficult I'm having it in my life. We are not all perfect. And things are tough. That's why we're here. That's why this church is supposed to be here coming together, to encourage those who are going through difficulty. But why did they have to die? I think there's two reasons. First, death will serve as a sign. It will. This is the beginning of the church at this point. The people need to understand their role in the body. They had just, Christ is just now gone. They are now living communally. They really haven't started any churches. This is early on. At this point, I don't even think Saul has become Paul. Saul hasn't even cut, hit that Damascus road yet. He may have. It may be a chapter around. But at this point, we've still got a lot of issues going on in the church. The church is too weak to have liars around it. God's not going to put up with it. He is showing himself mighty to these people, and he expects them to stand up and be what they've been called to be. No more playing around. This is, it. this is the most important time in history. God will not put up with those who will draw God's work away from its targets. If these people will lie, they may cheat, they may steal, they may pull the church off course. God needed a sign. He needed to make, make a, a point at this point because he understood who they were. Again, only God knows the heart. He understood what they might be doing in the future. And he needed a perfect example. There's always a joke, and it's not really not a joke. I've been in church long enough. Any pastor will say it. But sometimes the best thing a church needs is a good funeral. Have you ever heard that? The old griping, complainer, whiner that gripes about every little $5 you spend at the church. Sometimes a funeral is a good thing. Move it on. Now, they will be hugely nicer about it. They may not publicly say it like I did in a church setting. They will say, sometimes it's good if our church brothers and sisters find other churches to go love in and to spend time with. But you know what I mean. Sometimes, Lord, please remove this person. And I've been in churches where we've had trepidation about a future. We know that God wants to go this way. And the leader of the church, there's always one somewhere. This person does not want it to move. I've been in there where they've had a car accident on the way to the church. And they aren't there for that meeting. And therefore, God's way gets sadly enough, crazily enough, voted in. I've seen those crazy things. I've heard it where people, the, the major leaders in a church have a car accident and die at the same time. The ones who are totally opposed to everything going on in the church. And at that point, God now frees up the church. This is what they needed here in the first century. They needed a sign. Those people needed to understand that this is not a joke. Second thing. Ananias and Sapphira had seen the work of the Holy Spirit. They were responsible. Can you imagine what God was doing in that little community? That little tent community outside of Jerusalem. Can you imagine what he was doing? He's showing himself day after day, healing people and bringing miraculous food and taking care of all their needs. They're probably as happy as they can ever be. Because of their closest for the work of God, they are held more responsible. Second Peter 2.21, For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy command delivered to them. All of you are held responsible if you've seen God. Sadly enough, you're held responsible now for hearing this message. Every time you know more about God, you're more responsible for his message. He may not have dealt with someone who just walked in out off the street that day. Dif he may have dealt with them differently than he did Ananias and Sapphira, but they've been living with these people and seen the Holy Spirit work. You can guarantee that night there was revival in the camp. 
Okay? Everybody who had said a mad, mean thing to everyone else was, please, Lord, forgive me. Please forgive me, Marty, for saying I didn't mean it. I, was, I didn't mean it because I didn't want to say that. I love you. I, and you can guarantee every penny that they had been hoarding, that, that was a big offering that night. You can guarantee there was gold and silver and clay or whatever they sold and used that night. It was a big day in the, in the church house. Okay? Because that sign reminded everyone where they're supposed to be. Time to wake up. We're responsible for our knowledge. So two kinds of people in the church. One, which one are you? People cannot hide from God. An offense can be greater for some. They had seen God work. They were responsible for what they knew. Finally, fear is a part of worship. Go to verse 11. Then great fear came on the whole church and on all who heard these things. You can guarantee, as I said, it was a great revival night. That was a night to be remembered. Everyone got focused. They straightened up their lives. Those deaths reminded them of what seriousness their sacrifice would mean. Those who were just playing at being a Christian understood their calling and responsibility. Go on to verse 14. In your Bible, this may be broken up by a different paragraph, but it really is connected with the thought here. Verse 14 says, uh, Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, crowds of both men and women. Ananias and Sapphira's deaths were part of the signs and wonders that were offered by the disciples. These people died. This is showing how serious God is. God's not playing around with you. At this point, this is where we need to be. I'm, uh, this is the kind of thing that God wants to be part of. Look at all the things, the miraculous things. God's not playing around. He's serious. He is here. He's removing anyone who's an obstacle in this camp. This is where I want to serve. It gave the apostles more credibility. Everyone listened to them more intently. If they'd become a little complacent, they wake, they woken up really quickly. Oh my goodness, if this is what life is here, I want to be part of that. God was seen as bigger and more important. It's not an afterthought. And I think that's where our problem is most of the church today. We just go through the motions. We haven't looked for God to move, therefore we get what we expect. Nothing. I want you every Sunday morning to walk in these doors expecting something great. If you expect that, maybe you'll walk out having seen something great. Maybe it'll just be you were changed. But if you come in expecting nothing every Sunday morning, I can guarantee you're going out pleased because you're getting what you asked for. Nothing. Come in expecting to see God do something amazing. Come in expecting to see miracles around you. Who knows what that would look like? I'm, I'm jealous for several churches back when I was in to see God working like he did in that church. I'm jealous for that here. I want to see him do amazing things. And it means you've got to come ready for it. This is just not the thing we do every 168 hours in a week. Every Sunday morning at 11, I go to church. You should be looking forward to it. Friday night, start planning and thinking, Lord, please let Sunday morning be great. Saturday, I'm excited about church. Lord, I'm looking forward to seeing my friends again. I'm looking forward to being with my, my people. My people, they're like me. These people are just like me. They love the Lord. It's going to be great. Maybe God will save someone or change a life. Maybe God will heal you or change you or restore you or bring you back or solve that problem. But come expecting it. Do you have fear of worship? Do you? Do you fear God? This is a literal fear at that point. They knew what God can do. I want you to have a literal fear of God, but I want you to have an awe and a respect for him. We see that. We tend to easily translate that in the Old Testament. We just go right to the awe part. Fear means awe. No, God's big. And God can take you home today if he chooses to, if you're in his way. If you're going to draw people off, if he's got a message he needs to tell, he's going to get it told and he doesn't need you in his way. I understand my God to be big like that, but I also have an awe and a love for him because of the way he's loved me when I'm unlovely most of the time the way that he gave his life. So this morning, where are you?